<coughs> okay, so everything is fine. Um, sorry for changing the topic of my, uh, of my talk. I'm not going to talk about quantum gravity. Um, I sort of was impressed by the gathering of brains here, level of people here. Um, it's not flattering, I believe it. So I want to take this opportunity to present uh, one idea. Uh, it's a very simple idea. It, it requires some time to uh, explain it. It's not fully developed. In fact, it's very little developed. Um, I think it's interesting, so I want just to propose it to uh, you. And it uh, regards, let's see if I, yeah. It regards uh, the direction of time. Um, uh, if you really want to know <coughs> about quantum gravity, how to do physics without space and time, uh, there's a book coming out by Francesca and myself, though this is my first advertisement of the book. Um, so here's the idea. It's, uh, I, I ask you to follow me through a simple uh, story. Uh, imagine this box uh, with some gas and particles moving around, some simple Newtonian dynamics that just bounce. And uh, I show you a picture of one moment of time in which they are arranged in some manner. Looks completely random. And in fact, I don't just, so this moment of time is called TB. It's not, I don't just show you that, but I show you a full motion of this gas. Well, this is another moment of time, TA, the same balls that move around. I don't have enough to, uh, computer expertise to show you the full movie. But I don't tell you which way time goes. So I don't tell you whether TB is before and TA is, is after, so whether this movie was taken going from here to here or the other way around. I just give you the, the sequence of the uh, positions, all right? And I ask you, was it TB before or after TA? You look at that and I say, you say, we have no hint, right? It's the same random disposition or random distribution. There's nothing that suggests us, uh, uh, allows us to guess which, was, which one was the past, which one was the future. But I say, well, wait, wait a minute. This was, uh, this was shown with, uh, I don't know, a uh, little light, let me turn the light on a little more so you see some feature of this particle, you recognize some characteristic of this particle. So I turn the light on and that's what you see. You see this? The, the yellow is on. So you see that all the yellow particles are on one side here and then they, they get mixed up. So then you see, oh, oh now you can guess it. Uh, TB was before and TA was after. I think that almost all of us who are physicists would go to this guess. So what have we done? Let me formalize this a little bit. Uh, just re, re, so that's a conclusion, right? TB is before TA. That's before, that's after. So let me say exactly what has gone on a little bit more formally in what we have done. Essentially, uh, we have noticed that there's a subset of particles which are the yellow ones, which is those ones, who first were all here, all then they were mixed up. So let me just characterize this by defining a quantity, which is sort of where they are, the average position. Uh, sigma is a subset of particle, so the sum of their position, normalized, the number, how many they are. And so uh, I have a macroscopic observable, which is where are the yellows. And uh, I notice <coughs> that there are much more positions where the macroscopic observable is here than the position that the macroscopic observable is there. So that's what the brain has done by saying that's the direction of time. So in other words, uh, counting the number of microstates with the same microscopic observable is just called computing the entropy of these things. The entropy can be defined in the microcanonical, so the number of microstates given a mic macrostate, given a coarse graining, given a macroscopic observable. So this is the entropy. It's just uh, in, uh, the, 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 the integration of phase space, uh, of, of the region of phase space uh, where um, the observable has a value given by a certain value you want. So the entropy depends uh, on the actual macro state that everybody doing statistical mechanics know very well that you need some coarse graining, just saying something you all know very well. And then you notice that if I take my time direction, T is, is in yellow here, as going from here to there, then the entropy increases. So the, we believe in the second law of thermodynamics, so we know that this was before and that was after. Simple, okay? So this is before, this is after, okay? Now, turn the light down, 
still the same story you don't see. But then I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. I have some glasses here, some polarized glasses. I gave you the glasses, and you see a little bit better. And now you see some other feature of this particle. So you put your glasses on, same particle, right? Same story, same movement. You put your glasses on, and that's what you see. OK? I've never contradicted anything in physics so far. So you notice that all the, red, all the particles on this side here are red, while the particle red are just spread here. So with your glasses, you go through exactly the same story once again, and you say, oh, obviously, that was earlier in time, and time goes down. Right? So it's the same story as before. So you, you, you get an increasing uh, uh, entropy in a time which is the opposite direction of the previous one. Well, that seems to be a little confusing because it seems to be saying that whether I see, uh, whether I think that this is time, this is before, this is late, or in, a, in other words, whether the second principle of the dynamic is realized in one direction or the other, doesn't depend on the microstate, but depend on the coarse grain, on the coarse graining which I've done. Okay, with respect to the coarse graining defined by the macroscopic observers or picked up by this, time goes in one direction. With respect to the same time direction, the coarse grain is defined by the other um, uh, macroscopic observables, the entropy goes, uh, goes down. And if you think for a moment, uh, given any story, microscopic story, of my balls moving around, you can always pick up an observable such that on one end, whatever end you choose, is uh, low entropy. So it might very well be that entropy increase, and uh, we know that entropy increase is our characterization of passing of time. All uh, uh, ways of thinking about passing of time um, depend, well, it is a fact that it depends just not on the uh, microstate of the world, but also the microscopic observable. Uh, but uh, what I'm, the, the message is just simply remember that. And in fact, one can even go to a stronger conjecture that uh, I present a simple system, but every sufficiently rich ergodic system, anything that's sufficiently complicated, uh, any generic uh, uh, motion, there is always a coarse graining such that entropy increases in one direction or the other. That's the first message. Now, so far it seems a little bit disappointing because it seems that I'm moving the the question about the direction of time to something that depends how we define things, how we pick macroscopic observables, right? But don't, we don't pick macroscopic observables at random. And that's the second message I want to present. So uh, does the fact that entropy increase just depends on the fact that we have chosen one observable or the other? Well, no, of course. Because the coarse graining and the choice of the relevant observable for defining something is not some arbitrary mental thing is dictated by physics. So let me illustrate this with the same box as before, but increasing a little bit the situation. So imagine that uh, I have the same particles. I, call, I now call them heavy particles, and I have n of them. And imagine that I have many more particles, small particles. Here they are, up there, which I call sm watcher particles, small, um, which are 2 to the n. 2 to the n is the number of subsystem of n things, right? So each one of the small particles, the 2 to the n, I can, is, is related, in fact, I'm going to see in a moment, is physically related to a subsystem, a subset of the n particles. So each watcher particle sigma, uh, I label them, the small ones, uh, in the same manner I label a subsystem of them, because I assume they're related one to one. There's one watcher for each subsystem, OK? And I just imagine some physics, let me invent some physics for you, where the uh, watcher particle uh, sigma is attracted by the subset of particles. So for instance, let me do it for a second. There is a, par a particle here, which is this one, which, which is related to this, 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 and particle is attracted by this, just super simple physics. Each one is attracted by a different one. Okay? You got, you got the picture. So now what happens? Well, what happens is that uh, there, is, there will be one of these particles which is related to the particle that we're on the right here, okay, which uh, at time tb is sort of out of the center, at time ta it is on the center. While, there, oops, 
while there would be another uh, particle, which is this one, which is the, the one that happens to be related to these ones, which at time ta is out of the center, at time tb is, goes, is, is, is at the center. Now suppose you, well, now this red particle here interacts with all the large particle, but doesn't interact with all the degrees of freedom of them. It's just attracted by the average. So it interacts with one microscopic observable. So if it interacts with one microscopic observable of a system with many degrees of freedom, this is exactly like when we have a gas and we measure its volume, pressure, and temperature, we interact with some microscopic system, some microscopic observable system with many degrees of freedom. So as far as the effect on the red particle are concerned, the behavior of the, uh, the gas, of the, of the heavy particles, is just described by a macroscopic observable, which is the one I said before. And this macroscopic observable defines an entropy that goes in one direction. The opposite for the yellow one. So in this world, there is one subsystem, red little particle, okay, which interacts with the rest of the universe in a manner which is dictated by physics, but it's physics of its interaction, to be such that the entropy goes in one direction. And there is another one, the red one, which, same story, the opposite direction of time. Okay? So there is a subsystem for which uh, entropy grows, uh, this is now the same T, in, 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 in growing T, and one system in which entropy grows in decreasing T. So the same world is seeing a as having increasing or decreasing entropy, okay, uh, by different subsystems having different coupling with the rest. I use a sort of uh, anthrop anthrop anthropomorphic language, but there's nothing anthropomorphic here, right? There's a, a subsystem interacting with the rest of the world through some variables. These variables define a microscopic variable, so define a coarse graining and uh, therefore define a uh, thermodynamics of, of the heavy particles as they affect the, the small particle. So this is the so number two. Entropy increase, passing of time, experience, again, this is a sort of fake anthropomorphic language, there's nothing anthropomorphic here, nothing subjective, um, affects a subsystem depend on the way the subsystem couple to the, to the rest of the world. And then, the little uh, physical system that I presented to you suggests a strong conjecture, which is if the system is sufficiently complicated, the universe is complicated, and is sufficiently ergodic, there will always be a subsystem which experiences entropy increase in one direction, in, in an arbitrary direction, right? Now, if you think for a moment, it's hard to believe that this is not true if you just think about statistical mechanics. But if this is hard to believe it's not true, this has strong consequences. So let me uh, summarize what I've said just to, just, then I come to cosmology because I haven't touched cosmology, yes. So message one, entropy increase depends on the macroscopic observable, not just of the specific of the microstates. And I, I, I suggest that uh, for every sufficiently complicated system, there's always a macroscopic observable that increases whose entropy increase in one direction in an arbitrary direction. Second, uh, the choice of the macroscopic observable is just dictated by the way one system couple, coupled to the other. And uh, conjecture number two for a sufficiently uh, large and uh, many degrees of freedom system, a sufficiently complicated system, ergodic and so on, there will be always subsystems which interact with the rest of the world not with all the degrees of freedom of the rest of the world, with some degrees of freedom of the rest of the world, in such a way that these coarse graining define an increasing entropy for the, for the rest of the world in one direction or the other. So this little system lives in a world oriented in time. Okay? Good. So that was the story to start with. Now why I'm talking about that in a cosmology, philosophy of cosmology context. The overall question I'm addressing is uh, uh, why is the future different from the past? This has been discussed by you know, zillions of books. I'm not going at all through all the discussion. I'll just give you the, uh, what I believe is a rather large consensus about a partial answer to this question. 
uh, there are all sorts of arrows of time in physics, in science, uh, thermodynamics, retarded potential electromagnetism, biological, psychological, so on and so forth. I think there is a consensus that they all come from the second law of thermodynamic. Um, this is a standard reference quoted by people in statistical physics. And in turn, I think that there is a consensus that, uh, about the following. So this question, why the second law of thermodynamics given the time inversion uh, symmetry invariance of uh, uh, microphysics, or more precisely, the CPT invariance of microphysics? Well, because of the initial conditions that are special, right? So in a laboratory, the physics that we test is always time invariant, but if we choose special conditions, which we do all the time, they just move toward increasing entropy. If we make a lot, a lot of experiment and we select the ones with low final entropy, we could go the other way around. So it's always uh, low pass entropy. But why do we have low pass entropy? Well, because we live in a universe where pass entropy was, uh, entropy was uh, low in the past. So I think there's a consensus in large, large majority of people think about these things that the origin of all arrows of time can be traced to something that we vaguely can call the low entropy of the initial state of the universe. So for some mysterious region, reason, the universe in which we live started off in a low entropy, right? The initial state of the universe is a very special one, is a low entropy one. Um, example, um, in all of our models of space time, space time started off not crumpled. I make reference to um, John Barrow. Uh, out of the uh, space of solution of Einstein equations, for some reason, you know, if, if you take a, say you, you take a cosmology that recontracts, when it recontracts, they're all of black holes and is extremely crumpled, the, 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 the geometry. If you go in the past, we don't see that. Why don't we see that, okay? It's a very special, the initial state is special, okay? So uh, Roger Penrose, who has discussed that, came up with, even with uh, thinking, well, there should be a low physics, a new low physics. He postulated that the initial singularity is a zero vial curvature while future singularity might be generic, and this breaks the time inversion, and that's the origin of second law of thermodynamics. What I want to suggest is that maybe it's not uh, an extra law of physics, maybe it's a story that I gave you before. So I want to suggest that the microstate of the universe is, could be generic, so the initial microstate of the universe does not to be very special to get this low entropy, it could be the Macroscopic observable we use to describe it that give it low entropy at the beginning. And why we use these macroscopic observables? Because we are coupled to the universe through a particular set of observables. And why are we coupled to the universe with respect to this particular set of observables? Well, because we belong to a subsystem that is coupled to the universe with this particular set of observables. And why do we belong to such a special universe? Well, because that's what we are. We are things that lives on time, okay? So if this story is correct, the question of why do we see entropy growing, growing in one direction is the same question of why my name is Carlo, right? It's not, uh, I am Carlo. I'm the one who is called Carlo. So I don't have to explain why my name is Carlo. Um, so the second law of thermodynamics, which is certainly true, no doubt about that, might be true because it's perspectival. So it's true with respect to a subsystem and we are the subsystem with respect to which it is true. That's a key idea I want to present. Let me give you a, a super simple version. This is not elaborated, this is not, but I want to just make a little bit slightly more concrete. Take uh, us, by us I mean the bio biosphere, the earth with all the living st thing on side. It interacts with uh, light, right? It's important, it's interaction with light. So there's uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun and electromagnetic radiation going out to the, to the, to the, to the sky. Now, this electromagnetic radiation is described by Maxwell equations. Maxwell equation, of course, the time reversal invariant, is just a solution of Maxwell equation. Okay? This micro description is no preferred time direction. But um, the biosphere does not couple to the details of the electromagnetic radiation, it does not react to all possible phases or all possible wavelength. It only couples essentially to energy and uh, frequency, right? It's a, I don't know, 
the green stuff, chemistry in the, in, in, in the leaves. It's only, it only knows about the frequency and the, and the energy of the... Uh. So suppose I describe this electromagnetic radiation only in terms of macroscopic observable, which are energy and frequency, say, average on some small region or some small amount of time. Then, of course, I'm giving a macroscopic description of this, which is the one we usually do all the time, but it's a macroscopic description of this. And uh, um, the energy that comes in and the energy that goes out are equal because more or less the temp temperature is stable. Actually, we, we hope it remains stable. Uh, but the frequency is much higher in the light that comes than the light that goes out, right? And uh, this implies a much higher uh, entropy here than there because essentially you count the number of photons. One high frequency photon corresponds to the many low frequency photons. So you have much more entropy here with respect to this coarse grading. So this system is, entropy, is, is an, a system that produces entropy, there's a high entropy production with respect to this coarse grading. It is because it coupled to energy and frequency average that it lives in time. It lives in a, in a strongly time-oriented thing. I don't want to overplay this example, right? It's more a illustrative uh, uh, comics of the story. But the key is this, the uh, uh, microstate of the universe might be not so peculiar. It is our self or the system we belong to to be peculiar observables. So we couple to macroscopic variable uh, which are such that low entropy was low at the uh, beginning. So the initial low entropy might not be due, might not be to be searched in the microscopic state but in the coarse grading. How much time do we have? Okay, so a few, first of all, a few, co few general comments. Um, um, then some connection to other ideas, but this always will be short and I'll leave time then for questions and I'm sure you will have a lot of questions. Um, I gave this story in a non-relativistic setting, non-general relativistic setting, classical setting in the simple possible because I think this story is, uh, is, is general. So it, it makes sense already on no relativistic level, no in the classical level. But of course, <clears throat> uh, if we want to use it in cosmology, we have to think in terms of cosmology, and relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum gravity, and so on. So let me just make one comment of how things might change in, uh, in, 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 in the context we're using. First of all, cosmology. Cosmology um, is not the theory of everything in the universe. It's a theory of the large-scale degrees of the universe. I think this is a confusion that people, especially people who are um, highly theoretical minded sometimes do. Uh, in cosmology, when I do my cosmological model, I don't, have, I don't include the degrees of freedom of David sitting there and his, okay? I'm averaging all that. And so cosmology is very coarse-grained description of the universe, extremely coarse-grained description of the universe. Cosmology is a, a description of the universe of very large, um, the scale factor, which is the main variable in cosmology, uh, of course it is very much time-oriented in its evolution, right? The universe is small, it's becoming large. But remember that it could be just like the A sigma, a, the, the variable A sigma, which was the average position of this. It, it, it's a macroscopic observable that could be picked out by what? By us coupling to that, or us being re related to that, because that makes up, uh, 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 gives us a time, time oriented, oops, time oriented, um, in fact, that's what exactly what I want to do. Sorry. Uh, 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 that's what gives us a, a time oriented context in which what we are could be. Now, in general relativity, uh, of course, the story must become far more complicated because general relativity doesn't have a single time variable preferred. Generativity is, the, is, the, is the, the theory of relations between different variables uh, uh, evolving. So there is even less than uh, a preferred direction, there is even a, a preferred uh, uh, time that, miss, that is not there in that generativity, unless you take approximation like cosmology and so on and so forth. So the story needs to be um, uh, extended to that case. But in generativity there is even less a preferred duration of time than in classical generativity, exactly for the same uh, reason. So the problem of the uh, 
perceived direction of time, second order dynamics is there. Even more in quantum mechanics. In fact, in quantum mechanics, things tend to be even stronger because quantum mechanics, uh, there is an entropy which is sort of peculiar, which is phenomena entropy, right? When you trace and you have the correlations, which very much depend on the splitting. So the entropy we usually talk in quantum mechanics, which is for Neumann entropy, is something which has nothing to do with the system as a whole, all its degrees of freedom, but is born precisely because we uh, uh, consider the interaction of one subsystem with respect to other subsystem, right? Um, and in quantum gravity, this is my second uh, advertisement of the book. In quantum gravity, you know, I, I, I'm a believer in loop quantum gravity. Um, space and time themselves emerge from uh, their semi-classical approximation of a uh, uh, quanta uh, of, uh, uh, of space. So the full uh, space-time is an approximation. In a sense, is a coarse graining. The fundamental equation of quantum gravity, which I wrote here, uh, of loop quantum gravity, um, there's no time at all, there's no preferred direction of time even less. So there even more, we need a story to uh, justify or to make sense of the second law of thermodynamics and of so-called low initial condition. And what I'm, I've tried to do is a story of that sort. So a few related issues and ideas to some uh, people who have talked about similar things. Let me start by saying that uh, uh, Simon is here and David are here. Uh, this is the book they've uh, edited together about uh, many universe. I always had an objection about uh, many universe, which is things branch, okay? But the fundamental microphysics is time invariant. So why didn't they publish a book um, with this pic pic picture rather than with this picture, right? If the fundamental equation of, oh yeah, if the fundamental equation of, of, of the world is the will the wit equation for the universe or a function of the universe, what tells it to branch in one direction? So here I'm trying to offering you a way out um, of the, object, the objection that I've always presented to you, which is that the branching is not a feature of the wave function. The branch is a feature of the split and the subsystem interacting with the rest. And it's with respect to one subsystem that there's a branching. And if there's a subsystem with a such that there is a branching appropriate, then you get this picture, then you get a second law of thermodynamics associated to that. Um, Jenin is here, and uh, uh, Jenin has uh, uh, written a lot about uh, all the aspects of the world that depend on our own perspective on it, right? And uh, I think uh, uh, there is a lot to learn from, uh, uh, from that side of philosophy. And uh, what I'm saying might be connected to that. So what I'm suggesting is that the second law of thermodynamics, which of course is true, uh, might not be true because the microstate of the world is funny and it goes from low entropy to high entropy. But with respect to um, the subsystem, with respect to a subsystem, and uh, with respect to the subsystem uh, I belong. So it's perspectival, quite in a way, uh, Jenna can comment on that, related to the, uh, her uh, uh, pointing out perspective aspect in, uh, in physics. Max, I don't believe is here. Uh, Max Tegmark has a paper in which the idea is quite similar to that, but uh, different. In, uh, 212, I'll skip that. Um, David has, a, has discussed a lot how the low initial entropy is sort of required and needed uh, implicitly in everything, every time we do physics to, do, to know what has happened in the past. When we use present data, uh, you will correct me if I'm misrepresenting uh, what you're saying, if we have present data, we can from this infer what has happened in the past, but the reason we can do this is because uh, uh, we assume um, low entropy in the past, especially say in the past. Otherwise, we wouldn't. Um, I'm not going to uh, continue uh, on that. And uh, uh, David has been saying, well, in this sense, we are we need to add one extra phys law of physics, which is the, uh, something about the initial condition. Something special about the initial condition. Here, I'm suggesting we don't have to add anything. Uh, to the law of physics for the same reason I don't have to add law of physics saying that my name is Carlo Rovelli. I mean, I'm just the person called Carlo Rovelli. It's nothing to explain about that. And Jim, uh, uh, Jim has a way of uh, thinking um, about a quantum system, okay, in which there is no um, a priori uh, predictivity. 
And the predictivity comes in because there are quasi-classical realms. This is all the work that's been developed with, uh, uh, with Gelman. And uh, the cla quasi-classical realm realms uh, uh, emerge from uh, 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 macroscopic observables, which are average densities uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in space-time. Now, I am a bit short of time. I don't want to go too much in that. I think that what is interesting here is, uh, is the uh, densities in space-time, uh, which depend on locality, locality meaning the fact that things are next to one another, uh, something that comes before or after the coarse graining that allow us to define macroscopic observables. So in a full quantum theory of gravity, do we, do we have to think that uh, there is a locality that somehow emerge and this defines a special coarse graining or perhaps the, way the other way around, is the way we couple to I'm making a long story too much short here, so I, I probably am not understood here. But I want to conclude and leave time for some questions. So let me just summarize the main idea. First of all, it's a, it's a sort of statistical mechanical conjecture. Now I'm back to sort of uh, statistical mechanics in a non-relativistic context. Uh, uh, the conjecture is that if you have a system which is sufficiently large, sufficiently macroscopic, generically, there would be a subsystem coupling to the rest in such a way that uh, the rest behaves in the way interact with the subsystem um, in a manner which is well described by thermodynamics where the initial entropy is low and it grows with a direction of time. And there would be another subsystem for the opposite direction of time. So this is a Precise conjecture, uh, which might be true or false, my intuition tells me that it could be, uh, could be, could be right. If this is so, if this is correct some, to, some, to some level, then we might relate entropy increase, and entropy increase means the whole of our experience of passing of time. Um, not so much as a peculiarity of the microstate of the, of the world as a, as a whole, but as a peculiarity of the coarse graining we use and the microscopic universe uh, aspect that we use for, uh, for, for describing it. And in turn, those are not arbitrary. Those depend on the way we couple to the rest of the universe. And why do we couple to the rest of the universe in this way? Because if we didn't couple to the rest of the universe of this way, it wouldn't be us. Us were things as biological entities or that uh, very much uh, live in time. So couple in a, in a manner such as the past uh, move toward the future in, in a precise sense. Which sense? The one described by the second principle of the dynamics. So the uh, slogan, the story, the one-line sum summary is that the second law of thermodynamics is of course true. Uh, as many physicists said, whoever questioned the second law of thermodynamics should not be taken seriously. Uh, but it might be perspectival. It might be not true for the world as a whole independently of the splitting in subsystem but it might be true with respect to the splitting in some system for some subsystems. Uh, this is a paper where I've put some of these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Garo, for an interesting talk. Um, if I understand you correctly, then we should expect, or let me put it in a question. Should we expect, if we take your point of view, that there would be other biological systems that work in a different way that for which they, the evolution has happened in the opposite direction and that one day we will encounter intelligent beings that tell us that our old time goes in the opposite direction? And, and if not, why not? Um, well, it's, uh, we don't even know if there are other things we could talk about in the universe uh, like us. Probably yes, probably no. Uh, at, at the level of absolute abstractness, yes, I think so. Uh, so exactly like you know, the, the little red uh, watcher particle sees an entropy in one direction, there's a little yellow that sees an entropy in the other direction. So on the same microstate of the world, uh, you might think the subsystems that couple that have a different uh, uh, time directions. I wouldn't go into any speculations about uh, time-reversed civilizations. 
Uh, David, do you want me to chair for the rest of the session? Because <laughs> it so involves your own work. <laughs> Eric Curiel. So, uh, thanks for the talk, Carlo. But um, it's, uh, this is actually a question that's uh, um, er Eric Curiel. So, uh, this is a question that's somewhat related to uh, the one that was just asked. So, if, if we take seriously the idea that there are some other physical systems that um, whose arrow of time runs the opposite way, then it seems plausible, at least, that one of the properties that they uh, one of the pr uh, properties they won't couple to is stress energy, because that's pretty much the most fundamental property that we use to couple to the rest of the universe, we as subsystems. But if they, if they don't couple to stress energy, then would they not come up with a theory of general relativity if we could hit them with sticks and they wouldn't feel it? I mean, what, I, this, this is hard for me to understand. Stress energy might mean different things. I think what you implicitly mean is stress en energy averaged over a region much larger than the Planck scale. Uh, if yeah, won't yeah I, I, mean, I mean coarse grained, yes. Coarse grained. So if the, uh, uh, I, I do believe that there's a picture of the world in which uh, we have an expanding universe, uh, uh, we have regions much larger than the Planck scale, and uh, uh, it, it's very consistent and it's strongly time oriented. There's no doubt about that. And uh, anything else that would describe the universe in these terms would describe the universe in these terms, so one direction of time. Right? But remember the red watcher. It sees uh, very clearly a time-oriented macroscopic variables that evolve in one special direction. The grain of the world is much more complicated. The Planck scale things fluctuate widely, and there might be all sorts of other observables. In fact, those observables are many, but they're an, a, an extremely small part with respect to all other possible observables, including some, and that's the relation to Jim, that might not be local from our perspective. So with respect to this, I see no reason for which, if I could give you the micro state of the world uh, as a whole, uh, somebody couldn't take the, let's say, the end point arrival of the universe and start from there and say, look, there is nicely uh, uh, observable there such that uh, the entropy goes down this way. Of course, uh, this is not very precise, right? This is uh, intuitive ideas. And uh, it takes work to transform this into something precise. Maybe I'll just, for a second, <laughs> um, t uh, take Simon's implicit invitation. I, I really won't try to take up much time here. Look, but th there's a couple of things I'm confused about. Um, um, how shall I put this? There's people who have thought about the foundations of these sorts of matters have been clear for a long, long time that the way you decide to carve up the set of microstates into macrostates isn't arbitrary. It depends on dynamics, okay? Um, essentially, you want to you find a way of carving up the microstates such that you get a sort of fairly autonomous, stable macrodynamics of the world, like we have from thermodynamics and, and so on and so forth. Of course, there are lots of, of ways of carving up the microstate into macrostates that don't correspond to that. There's a nice example, there's a nice example, I mean, just the first one that pops into my head, due to Tim, about, look, you want to make it easy for yourself to make a Maxwell's demon? Um, carve up the world into macrostates like this. Let there be one macrostate whose volume is large in the middle. Not large like equilibrium, not large enough so that it almost dominates the energy hypersurface, but just much larger than all the others. And all the others are small. You start out the system somewhere in that larger macrostate. Hold, hold on don't, one second. Don't take advantage of the fact that you, there's no chair when you're making a question. No, I won't, I won't, I won't. <laughs> You, 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 carve, you, you carve the world up like that, start the system out in that macro state, its entropy will go down in either direction with very high probability. Or equivalently, let there be two sets of particles such that there's no interaction with one another at all. So, so far my They'll answer is yes. They'll form separate universes, their entropies can go in either direction. So I, I, th there's just a worry here that 
um, um, that you're not, that, that, that what you're saying isn't recognizing all of what we usually take to be connoted by the word macrostate. It's not some arbitrary way of, of carving up the space of microstates into bigger chunks. It's a way that depends very sensitively on what the dynamics of the world happens to be. Um, I, I don't know if that's a question or, or just something I want to hear more about or, or something like that. And let me give it over to other questions at this can, point. Can I answer? But, but sure, but yeah. I mean, just fine, <laughs> sure. Um, well, my short answer is I agree, I agree fully what you said. The second point is that uh, uh, in my first two observations, I did not mean to say anything strongly original, okay? Uh, especially the first one, everybody knows that entropy depends on the coarse graining. I would just remind it to everybody. The second one, not everybody know, but thinks we've talked about that, agrees that uh, the coarse graining is not a subjective arbitrary thing, it's just determined by the coupling. So I, I'm trying to build... Determined by what? By the dynamics, right. by the coupling. Right. So I was trying to build on it. So I fully agree with what you say. Um, Carlo, there's a big difference between the written version of your paper, what you say there. There you say history of a sufficiently rich ergodic system. In, in the paper you say any generic motion of a sufficiently rich system. It doesn't say ergodic. Okay. Now, the point about this is biological systems are by no stretch of the matter ergodic. They are selective systems. And so I just, sometimes you talk about this applies to biology. I simply don't think it applies to biology. Ah, good. Yes. Um, first of all, it's a conjecture, so I, I'm, I'm free to switch it. <laughs> right? It's not a theory. Um, by ergodic, I meant uh, here very weakly that uh, uh, it's very easy to make something that contradicts this co conjecture if it is too uh, periodic system will never satisfy that. Right? Um, Exactly. What you're saying is that biologic systems uh, are intrinsically non-ergodic, and they are intrinsically uh, different from, macros from microscopic uh, time-invertible dynamical systems. Um, I am trying to cash out on this difference and see what does the difference, where does the difference come from? Uh, biological systems are systems that couple to a world which is time-oriented, that see a world as a time-oriented world. They're intrinsically time-oriented, right? The way we think about biology, we cannot think of it backward, because how do we describe evolution backward? I spend a lot of time trying to think what is evolution backward. If the microphysics is a time reversal, there should be a backward description of evolution. What is it? I think this is not possible. Why? Because um, Biological, biology is intrinsically, in terms of certain microscopic observable, um, which have already broken the time invariance. So the suggestion here, you might not be happy with that, uh, the suggestion here is that uh, uh, what makes them special is precisely they are like the little red uh, watcher ball, that they are something that coupled to the rest of the universe through some uh, interactions and variable which describe, which determine a coarse graining of the rest of the world which is not time symmetric. So they live in a non time symmetric world. I'm not saying that this defines biology at all or this is sufficient for understanding. No, no, not for obviously. But I'm saying that this might resolve at least in part the contradiction between the time oriented, uh, uh, the, the time orientation which is intrinsic in biology and in psychology and the uh, absence of it in the fundamental questions. Uh, thank I, you, an interesting uh, paper. I just want to point out, as Simon uh, correctly said uh, last night, we need coarse graining sort of ahead of a time just to get decoherent histories and uh, probabilities. Uh, but we also would like to predict the classical world, which provide, which needs more coarse graining, right, than just that which is necessary for decoherence. Uh, namely, coarse graining, so that a system will have the inertia 
to be predictable in the face of the noise that typical mechanisms yes. of dequerence produce. Mm -hmm. And those variables are the natural conserved variables on small scales, densities of energy, momentum, and number. So there's, a, uh, starting from quantum mechanics, there's a kind of route to a preferred coarse graining, right, that leads to classical predictability inside of quantum mechanics, and it's that entropy, right, which is of most interest because when you derive, say, the Navier-Stokes equations from quantum mechanics, that's the entropy which uh, enters, and that is, in fact, the usual entropy of, um, of chemistry and uh, physics. It's not true, however, that it always increases because in examples going back to Carol and Chen, right, uh, also by us, if you consider a bouncing universe, uh, then, um, for example, with a no boundary proposal, the fluctuations are small at the bounce. So the thermodynamic arrows of time go in opposite directions on opposite sides of the bounce. Uh, so it doesn't you know, increase from big all, all the way. So there's no one time direction. There are two time directions on opposite sides of the bounce. So to answer the question about people, I presume in a bouncing universe, there'll be people on the other side of the bounce. Um, but it won't be very easy for us to um, send messages. We will have about as much chance of sending a message getting a message from people on the other side, as we have of sending a message backward in time, telling people to behave better in particular political circumstances. Thank you. I renounce my answer. Can I get the questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes. Can you get the... Uh, the, the two remaining questions? Uh, maybe we have time for two more. Bob and, yeah. Yeah, yeah Bob, well, I, I mean, the, this is somewhat related, I think, to what, uh, what David Albert was saying, but I mean, the, the issue is not to be able to find, you know, some coarse-grained observable where the entropy, well, going in our direction of time decreases, because uh, that's easy, uh, or a subsist, or light, as in your conjecture, there's absolutely no problem with that, it's just, Finding uh, you know an observable or a subsystem that has that first of all is restricted in the way David was saying uh, in terms of having some kind of well-defined macroscopic dynamics. So you're not allowed to just choose one trajectory, the one that it's on, and to find some observable relative to that, uh, you know, coarse graining relative to that. And I think most importantly, this uh, well increase or decrease, depending on which way you're choosing to choose the direction of time, continues for a sustained period of time. I mean, I can easily, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. given a system, find even a good macroscopic observable, you know, having examined that system very closely, for which its entropy will de decrease a little for a short amount of time, but then I'm, you know, then I'm in bad shape. I mean, so I, I don't, I don't think that your conjecture is stated has anything to do with anything. You, you need a conjecture about, you know, you can find observables of the character that David was saying for which uh, the entropy increases indefinitely or for at least a, a very long period of time, and that I don't think has a chance. One more, one, did you wanna? No, I just make one word at the end, but. Thanks, Carla. Just one very simple point, and it's only because it's a little philo philosophical point that hardly ever, hardly ever gets brought out. I'm Cormac O'Rafferty from Ireland. Um, of course, the, the, you know, the tension between what we observe in the macroscopic world and what we see in our equations and particle physics, for example, but you know, that whole tension does depend on a certain assumption. The assumption is how one views mathematics. There is, there is a view in, among some philosophers that if you look at mathematics as a, simply as a way to describe the world, this is a thing to do with mathematics. It's not necessarily a paradox at all. You know, it, it feeds into George Ellis's point about, you know, 
if, if mathematics, it's, qu it's the question of is mathematics of the universe or is ma mathematics a description of the universe? I always think the inherent assumption that there's a huge paradox here, we're, we're already making a philosophical judgment on that, which is fine, but we, we, we should be aware that we are making that judgment, I think. Yeah, I just uh, try, uh, I cannot, try, uh, I mean, most of these are very good comments, I just can say yes, but I can try to uh, answer collectively only one point. Um, I'm not saying that I have understood the second principle of dynamics. I'm not saying that uh, uh, I make a story about mathematics. I'm not saying that I know anything about uh, what happened to the, uh, uh, to the time direction, the other side of the balance. In fact, I keep getting confused about that, and Jim, you may be correct, I don't know. I'm only saying that I think that uh, uh, the question of why do we see a special direction of time to a large extent should or could perhaps be translated into a question on why we have a certain coupling, why we belong to a subsystem having a certain coupling to the rest of the universe, which imp if this is correct, and this has not been questioned by any of the questions, then the, macros the microscopic story about, the co this is cosmology, the microscopic cosmological description about the world doesn't need to be specially oriented in one direction or the other. That's the, I might want to decouple the second law of thermodynamics from the special initial universe. I'm not, I don't know if this, this is true, but it's just an idea I'm presenting. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker.